The fog of war erupts in the confusion caused by the chaos of war. And in the media, it's an intentional phenomenon that makes it extremely difficult for the public to separate fact from fiction. And while the battles over war narratives evolve, they all have a common goal, to distort reality on the ground. And so is the case for the crisis in Syria and this new Cold War with Russia. But ultimately, a quick glance at history's most notorious propaganda could help us understand just how falsehoods can cause mass hysteria hysteria enough for the public to support the next war. Now take the buildup for President George Bush's support for Kuwait's humanitarian war against Iraq. On October 10, 1990, a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl identified only as Nayara told the Congressional Human Rights Caucus that she witnessed Iraqi soldiers removing babies from incubators and leaving them on a cold floor to die. Now her testimony was cited by several senators and even President Bush as justification for backing Kuwait in the Gulf War against Saddam Hussein, which erupted just a few months later. However, it was later revealed that this young woman was the daughter of Kuwait's ambassador to the United States. And her testimony was arranged by a PR firm representing a Kuwaiti-sponsored group lobbying Congress for military intervention. More recently, during the Arab Spring uprisings that swept the Middle East in 2011 ahead of the U.S. bombing spree of Libya, Libyan media claimed that Muammar Gaddafi loyalists carried out mass Viagra-fueled rapes and that the Libyan leader had ordered rape as a weapon of war. When a prosecutor with the International Criminal Court opened an investigation into these allegations, it grabbed international headlines appearing in Al Jazeera, the BBC, and Reuters, among many other outlets. But even as Amnesty International questioned the legitimacy of the allegations, other supposedly humanitarian groups hit a loggerhead on the veracity of the claims. One top UN official said he believed the claims were meant as a scare tactic to invoke mass hysteria, even as another top UN official defended them, all creating a distraction from the war itself. But this mass hysteria became the justification for bombing the hell out of Libya and turning it into a failed state now overrun by groups like ISIS. And today, the fog of war is obscuring realities on the ground in Syria. Major news outlets frequently cite unnamed sources, a convenient way to manipulate public perception. From CNN to Reuters, these outlets are publishing unverified claims and providing minimal evidence to support them, while the public is supposed to drink it all up. Now, the crisis in Syria has attracted international attention and legitimate concern, and the corporate media is using the tragedies of war to push an interventionist agenda while boosting its audience. This push for content, no matter what, has serious consequences. On December 20th, for example, Egyptian police arrested five people for making videos they claimed were set in Aleppo, but they were actually filmed at a demolition site in that country. Social media further distorts reality on the ground, presenting a fragmented image of war as the media promotes only those whose accounts that align with the goals of the United States and its allies. Now, the media and public both accept the accounts of the White Helmets as gospel, yet that group, which purports to serve as a volunteer first responders in Aleppo, receives training from British mercenaries and funding from a PR firm tied to George Soros. Not only are the White Helmets making fake videos, but many of the responders have been even exposed as agents embedded with the Al Nusra Front and ISIS, armed and far from being impartial, even a recipient of millions of USAID funding. Whether the White Helmets are the first apolitical first responders they claim to be or not, one thing is clear. The narrative being weaved by and about them and others like them that are embedded with Al-Qaeda have one agenda, support for US military intervention in the war in Syria. Now take other activists frequently cited by the media, like Bilal Abdul Karim, who is embedded with the Nusra Front, who glorifies suicide bombers. Or Lina Shami, the young Syrian woman who promotes sectarian terrorists from Jaysh al-Sham, who threatened genocide against religious minorities as revolutionaries on her social media channels. It's time to put a critical lens to the propaganda in the news and social media. It's time to demand more than reporting that toes the government line and makes claims without any real evidence. And here to do just that is noted peace activist and author of War is a Lie and other books is David Swanson. Check it out. Thank you so much, David, for joining me today. I want to begin by talking about uh, the specific coverage that has been coming out of Aleppo because that reporting has been, you know, a story on its own. Who controls the narrative, uh, controls the public understanding of any war? Um, how has the propaganda worked in the case of Syria? Who controls that narrative? 
Well, I think maybe even more so than in some other wars, because there are not uh, embedded reporters with militaries. There are not uh, a lot of reporters from outside uh, the area or reporters at all on the ground. Uh, and so people are getting information via social media uh, from sources that have no more knowledge of the situation on the ground than they themselves do. Uh, and, uh, of course, the slant of the, the partisanship and the politics of those producing and packaging the news uh, is enormously shaping what you get. Uh, so, you know, of course, you can see through, you know, one story will refer to the liberation by the government and another to, you know, the, the fall to the regime. Uh, and you can interpret the facts as being the exact same thing in both stories. But uh, in other cases, you just cannot tell uh, unless you find uh, some reporter on the ground who you trust whether something has actually happened or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there is uh, an incredible push by certain parties, including uh, most U.S. media, uh, to paint the Syrian government uh, as evil to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and, of course, there is a great deal to work with there. Uh, and by others to uh, do the same for other parties. Uh, and so you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, but here we have, you know, today a ceasefire being announced that looks more serious than past ceasefires. Seems like incredibly good news. Uh, but, but I expect, you know, parties in the U.S. to be spinning it as, as bad, uh, you know, peace being a bad thing because Russia is in favor of it. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, so you, you have to, you, you have to try very hard to sort through and find uh, the facts, because every side is using the incredible suffering as logic for increased militarism by their side. Uh, and so you're getting very little reporting uh, that is actually in the interests uh, of peace and de-escalation. Uh, you know, and so you get exaggerated suffering on one party, exaggerated suffering by another party, uh, and minimizing the suffering uh, on the on the opposite sides by those same reports. It's it's very it's very hard to sort through. Um, but if if you begin looking for what might reduce the violence, uh, you can uh, you can generally decipher what's happening uh, in, a, in a broad sense. And I want to talk about the humanitarian aspect here, because uh, as you know, Syria has been painted as a humanitarian crisis that we need to intervene in. How have so-called humanitarian organizations or unnamed uh, officials played a role in manufacturing falsehoods about the crisis in Syria? Increasingly, humanitarian suffering uh, is more and more central to the packaging of wars, uh, from the, the, the fictional babies taken out of incubators and left on the floor before the Gulf War, uh, to the, uh, you know, to the uh, arming of, of brutal terrorists by Iraq before the escalation of 03, to the need to rescue people on a, on a mountaintop uh, from ISIS, to the looming massacre uh, in Benghazi, uh, prior to the to the overthrow and and murder of Gaddafi, uh, you know every single time. And, and in Syria, we have had claims of you know chemical weapons use by the Assad government uh, that have never been proven. We have had uh, people arrested last week in in Egypt for filming you know supposed footage of victims in Syria in Egypt. Uh, and, and that has been a, a phenomenon that we've seen uh, to a far greater extent in this war than any other I can recall. You know, sheer fictional dramatization of victims uh, and, you know, this recent uh, phenomenon of people sending their final message before they die uh, and then, of course, not dying in many cases, uh, thank goodness. And groups like the White Helmets, where, of course, there is some good being done, but they're being used uh, to dramatize one side of suffering in order to motivate increased militarism. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that it's very hard for people to see through without actually working at it, which is not what U.S. media consumers are are in the habit of doing. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to talk a little bit more now about Russia, um, because Russia has been a stalwart ally of the Syrian government and they've received a lot of criticism 
um, for their role in assisting uh, the uh, in assisting Syria. Uh, much of the rhetoric we've seen used against Russia is now reminiscent of the Cold War and even language we've heard uh, recently against the axis of evil. Um, how has the vilification of Russia changed over the years and how much of it has stayed the same in your opinion? Even as the Cold War had supposedly ended uh, and this new enemy was held up, uh, you know, instead of China, which they were planning, it, it became terrorism. Uh, Muslim uh, Middle Eastern terrorists became the new big enemy. But now it, it really is been moved back to Russia uh, by the Obama administration, by Hillary Clinton, uh, by Hillary Clinton supporters who are now just openly proclaiming that the the strength and merit of their candidate is proven by the fact that uh, she couldn't be defeated without help from Russia. Never mind that there's been no proof whatsoever offered that there was any help from Russia. Uh, never mind that the alleged help from Russia uh, was the alleged uh, revelation that the primary was slanted in her favor by the Democratic Party. Uh, and, and so now we have this this intense demonization of Russia that has taken a form today of the Obama White House announcing new sanctions against Russians uh, and uh, kicking Russian spies out of the United States and closing Russian compounds and so forth. Uh, you know, on the same day that we have this announcement of a peace agreement uh, in Syria, you know, most Americans have no idea that the United States has been fending off and sabotaging attempts at peace settlements in Syria uh, from Russia for years now. Uh, and that this is another one that may see that same fate if there's not a big push to make it stick and get the United States on board. Because ceasing to arm terrorists in Syria uh, by the U.S. government is not part of the agreement and has to be. Uh, if it's going to work. Uh, and so you, you uh, have now uh, th th this inclination by Americans to oppose something if Russia's involved uh, and if Russia and Donald Trump are involved. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's very, very dangerous that, that this sort of partisanship is placed ahead of the question of war or peace, which ought to be primary. And David, now the war in Syria has taken a really interesting turn because now we see the media openly glorifying um, and cheerleading for al-Qaeda to basically overthrow the Syrian government and take power there. Um, why, was my, why must we remain uh, critical in our understanding of the Syrian war? You know, it, it, these are essentially al-Qaeda, essentially uh, an organization that the U.S. government and its uh, sidekick media had demonized for over a decade, uh, being held up as, you know, the enemy of the enemy. And yet th this agreement uh, already today is being reported in the U.S. media as well as other media uh, as potentially involving uh, Bashar al-Assad stepping down as was, uh, of course, part of an agreement uh, reportedly brushed aside without consideration uh, three years ago by the United States when Russia put it forward. So, you know, you will end up seeing that, of course, the U.S. aim is not, in fact, just getting rid of Assad, but getting rid of Russia's foothold in Syria. And so uh, this will not please everyone in Washington, uh, but it will please those who have managed to uh, to make Assad their primary enemy. Uh, and if they can if they can get themselves away from the idea that that arming Al Qaeda uh, is is good for that cause and come to see a nonviolent settlement and humanitarian aid as good for that cause, that's all to the better. Thank you so much, David. David Swanson, author of War is a Lie and Peace Activist. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you.